The following program is brought to you by the Center for Educational Outreach at Baylor College of Medicine. Science Education Standards were published in oops, 1996, so they're now 12 years old. Pretty amazing. How many of you have a copy of the National Science Education Standards? Good, good. I hope you pull them off your shelf every so often. Uh, it's an amazing document. Our Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills are built on the National Science Education Standards. Provides a wonderful roadmap for what students should should learn and be able to do. But it also has some really important philosophical underpinnings. First, that everybody should do some science along the course of their education. So science is for everyone. It's not just for the folks who might be interested in becoming an engineer or a scientist or a physician. That we have to do science to learn science. Um, how many of you had driver's ed? I may be dating myself, but I had driver's ed in two phases. We had a classroom phase. Right? And then you had the driving around in the car phase, right? OK. How many of you could drive a car after the classroom phase? <laughs> OK. Right? OK. I, sure, I certainly couldn't. It even took me lots of the behind the wheel time. Uh, well, why would science be different, right? How can we learn it just from reading about it in a book? We need to do some science to really learn it and understand it. That science, the way we do it in schools, should actually be reflective of how science is practiced in our research institutions. And finally, that science is part of how we're thinking about education in its broader sense. So just as education is changing and improving, so should science education. So all of these ideas are threads in the National Science Education Standards. Oh, I actually <coughs> did lose. We lost one movie. We lost one picture when I moved from the Mac platform to the PC platform. So I'm going to let you imagine what science the old fashioned way looked like. Does anyone want to offer a, a, a guess at what old fashioned science instruction looks like? Anyone, a volunteer? Textbooks. Textbooks. How, how would the students be seating? seated? In rows. So you don't need the picture, you know. <laughs> Maybe a globe, maybe. maybe. Yeah. That's how I learned science. It's a miracle we have anyone going into science careers learning science that way. In fact, when I had elementary science, the only thing we learned were the types of clouds. That's all I remember. So these are some of the things that just came up, right? Read aloud from text. Let's memorize a long list. My daughter didn't go into science because she had to memorize in seventh grade all the bones in the human body. You know, that's not particularly useful. It might have been useful to learn how they work together or the, how muscles and bones work together to achieve movement, but they didn't get a chance to learn that, only the list of bones. Uh, contents presented in lectures, I apologize for, you know, it, kind of using that format here because we know that from lectures, most people only walk away with about 10% of what they heard. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, it is sometimes an efficient way to deliver information, but it's not the best way to teach science. And, how, and of course, thinking about that, how many of you only had lecture-based science courses in college? There you go, right? Yeah, it's amazing. In our, our universities are slower to reform how they're teaching science than anyone else. Uh, what about uh, rote recall, right? We're just going to repeat those facts we memorized. Lab experiences, we're going to know the answer before we start. And the goal of assessment is only to grade, right? That's the old way of teaching science. This is a much better way, where students are engaged in small groups, asking a question, doing the experimenting themselves, and coming up with their own conclusions, and supporting their conclusions with evidence. This builds those critical thinking and problem skills that we were talking about earlier. I already know that many of you are using this in your classroom. Uh, you've moved from lectures to having your students look at questions. You're having your students use cooperative learning strategies. 
you're not emphasizing facts, and you're thinking about teaching whole concepts. This is a tough one in the age of standardized testing. We know that if we skim across lots of topics, students end up really remembering very little at the end of the year. But if we let them explore something in depth, they learn a system in, 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 in all its complexity. It facilitates their learning of other systems and other models. So it, even though it sounds a little counterintuitive, given the emphasis on standardized testing, when you can, it's better to drill down and teach something in depth than skim across the top and just touch on a number of things superficially. It's better to learn by doing. It's better to let, have students' opportunities to interpret evidence. And it really does change your role to the reflective leader of what your students are learning in the classroom. And I think that's a wonderful place to be as a teacher. And I know many of you already are in that place in your teaching with your students. But elementary science is where it does begin. <laughs> and it's amazing what you teach in science ties into what they will learn throughout the educational continuum in science. For example, in grades K2, you might teach students how water evaporates from an open container, right? How many of you ever set a, a dish of water out on the windowsill and had students observe it, right? Yeah, it's just kind of fun for them to see, you know, the water is disappearing. That lays the foundation for some in very important understandings, but it has to start there. So they learn that water in an open container evaporates. Then in grades three through five, you start talking about gases and water vapor, right? That builds, because it's easier for them to understand that if they've already seen water evaporating. Then they find out about molecules and gases and how gases have molecules with slightly higher energy levels. And then in high school, they go on to learn that there's a huge amount of physical and biological phenomena that can be described by the motion and energy of molecules. But all of that started with the fundamental understanding that water in an open container evaporates. And without that baseline understanding, the students won't have the same type of conceptualization when they get to high school. It's amazing. In fact, they've studied. And for years, they found that boys who played sports and you know, would throw a football and understand you know, the trajectory that a ball would follow, they performed so much better in physics. Why? Because they had a mental picture of what a parabola looked like before anyone ever started talking about parabolas. It's that physical experience that builds these understandings that students capitalize later on. So what does the research tell us? One, it tells us that inquiry science improves test scores in science, reading, and mathematics. Certainly, this shouldn't be the prime motivator for teaching, but we know it's an important part of education today. And the good news is that inquiry science contributes to that. The other cool thing is, and this was brought up multiple times already this morning, it provides a great way to teach reading and mathematics in context and to use vocabulary in context. And of course, science is part of everyone's life. And it can be very personally motivating for everyone involved if they're learning something about themselves and the way they interact with the world. Which of the following of these examples might be examples of inquiry? Uh, investigating the function of a gene. Do we think trying to figure out what a gene does, would that be an example of inquiry science? And I'm talking big science questions, not what you might do with your students. Would that be an example of, of inquiry science? How about looking at water temperatures in Antarctica? Is that an example of inquiry? <laughs> so if someone is looking at changes in water temperature over time in Antarctica, would that be an example of inquiry? Sure. What about comparing the fossil bones of ancient man-like organisms? OK. What about testing how efficient it is to add gasoline ethanol to gasoline. That'd be an example of inquiry. OK, now here's the trick. All of these, you could, you could put together any number of appropriate scientific questions. For example, there was a little hesitation on this water temperatures in Antarctica. What if someone was looking at the effect of uh, the shrinking ice, uh, ice over the water and the effect that that had on, on water temperature? That certainly would be an appropriate scientific question, right? But guess what? We can't do it as a controlled experiment. Uh, this often happens in elementary schools, that kids get this idea that the only way to do an experiment is to have a control. 
when about half of the scientists out there never can do a control experiment because of the nature of what they're studying. So observational studies and comparative studies are also very important ways of answering appropriate scientific questions. Uh, and you know, investigating the function of a gene, we have to figure out what it, how it works. So there's not really a way to compare to do a controlled experiment in, in, in the classical sense. But they're all scientific questions. So this brings us back to this idea again of there's lots of ways to do good science. And to keep an open mind when you're thinking about this with your students. So what, what are some of the pieces that we would call science? First is having a good question. If you don't have a good question, you're not going to do good science. That's the bottom line. The question has to be a good one. And it has to be testable. You have to be able to figure out a way to answer it. You have to be able to describe what you did reliably. You have to ha come up with something that has predictive value. In other words, you could take your findings and apply them to another situation and have it be useful. Usually, they have something to do with cause and effect or changes over time. In fact, an important theme in science is how things change over time. time. Sometimes science is a direct experiment. Sometimes it's not. For example, what if we're out in the playground and we're looking at the, at, the, at the condition of the grass? And the grass over here is yellow and the grass over here is green. And the grass over here is in the shade and it's yellow and that grass is green. Could we formulate a hypothesis about the, the, whether the shade was making the grass yellow? Yeah. Sure we could. Could we test it? Sure. We could just go out and observe. And observe other shaded. We wouldn't have to do an experiment. We could observe other shaded areas on the, on the campus and, and test our hypothesis that way. But it needs to be repeatable. And also keep in mind that many new science areas start with an exploratory phase. So what makes a question a good question? I, usually, a non-scientific question involves opinion. For example, which breakfast cereal is better than another? Is that a scientific question? No, because can we define better? We really can't, right? We could say, you know, which, which one is crisper? Which one floats longer in milk? We could do some kind of social sciences survey and survey people and then convert it into a social sciences question. But it's usually not opinion. So let's just take, just to conclude, take, an, take a look at some different scientific questions. Or take a look at some questions and decide whether they're scientific. Um, could you take how is bug blood different from human blood? And turn that into a testable question? Yeah, we could turn that into a scientific question, couldn't we? Right. Could we answer scientifically, why do your fingers wrinkle after you take a bath? Yeah, we could, right? I'm seeing everyone nodding. We could figure that out, couldn't we? But how about this? Is this a scientific question the way it's written? Is rock music better than hip hop music? No, not your opinion. No. <laughs> if we were also testing it scientifically, right? Uh, we can't. Can anyone think of a way to turn that into a testable question? Hmm? Yeah, actually, we had a great, we had a, we had a, we had a volunteer in the front. She was saying, but we could do, we could investigate something about decibels and rock music and hip hop music. Couldn't we? We could do something about hearing loss, listening to rock, <laughs> rock music and hip hop music. And those of us, you know, who probably went to a few too many concerts are suffering, or wore those headphones, are suffering from hearing loss. What about the question, why does bright light cause some people to sneeze? Could we investigate that? We could. Sure. Uh, what a, do smells affect people's moods? We could do a scientific investigation on that. How about, is vegetarianism better than eating meat? Could we test that? Is that a scientific question in its current format? No. Anyone want to propose something related that could be a testable question? Oh, there you go. Uh, I had a, there, someone over here mentioned uh, we could look at the nutri nutritional value, right? Vitamins, proteins, minerals that are found in a vegetarian diet as opposed to eating a meat-included diet. And we'd probably have to define those diets up front. So it's all about the question. Which brings us back again to this notion of science is questions, but when we ask a question in science, it has to be a question that we can test. <laughs>
and that we can test using evidence. But the types of ways that we can test questions are as broad as science itself, which is wonderful. The entire, the open-ended nature of science really can be quite inspiring to all of us and hopefully for your students. And we're looking forward to exploring these questions with you uh, over the course of the next year and to learning about your questions and the questions that your students come up with.